Now that you understand the mechanics of flow cytometry from Tutorial 1, let's take a closer look at how the data collected by the instrument can be analyzed. Recall that flow cytometry is a technique for the rapid analysis of multiple characteristics of cell populations. As each cell passes through the laser beam of the cytometer, the detectors collect light intensity data for forward scatter, side scatter, and each of the fluorescence channels. This means the data file for each cell contains information on every collected parameter. In this tutorial, we will look at how data is collected and plotted, and how gates can be used to analyze subpopulations within the sample. We will also show you how to correct data sets when fluorophores have overlapping signals. And finally, we will walk through the basic steps required to run and analyze a typical three-color experiment. First, let's take a look at data collection. As a cell passes through the laser beam in the flow cytometer, it sends a light pulse to scatter and fluorescence detectors. That light is converted into a voltage pulse. In order for this pulse to be useful for analysis, it must be converted into a numerical value, and this can be done in any of three ways. The height of the pulse can be measured, the area under the pulse can be measured, or the width of the pulse can be measured. Depending on the flow cytometer system, either pulse height or pulse area is used to quantify the size of the voltage pulse. Pulse width is used in certain special situations, such as DNA analysis, where it is important to distinguish single cells from double cell events. Once the pulse has been converted into a numerical value, that value can be used to plot the intensity of the event. Once the data has been collected, we can use histograms or dot plots to graphically represent the data. Each of these plot types can be generated using linear scaling or using logarithmic scaling, also called log scaling. Here, cells are stained with a fluorescently labeled antibody reacting to the CD4 cell surface antigen, which generates events with fluorescence intensities that can vary 100-fold or more. If we use linear scaling in histograms for this type of data, it is difficult to see both the CD4 positive and negative populations at the same time. The CD4 negative population is compressed against the axis. Switching fluorescence to a log scale allows both populations to be seen clearly on the same plot. Conversely, in an experiment to measure DNA quantities in cells, we're dealing with a very narrow range of fluorescence values. If we plot this data on a log scale, important subtle differences are obscured. When these same data are plotted on a linear scale, the specific distribution of DNA amounts is more apparent. Histograms display simple information. However, biological samples usually contain multiple cell populations, each with different characteristics. These populations can be better distinguished by looking at two parameters at once. If a blood cell sample is probed with two fluorescently labeled antibodies reacting to CD4 and CD8 cell surface antigens, the resulting histograms show two populations for each antigen, fluorescent or non-fluorescent. The correlation between the CD4 and CD8 populations can only be seen using a dot plot. When the two histograms are aligned to the dot plot, we can see that each dot plot population is represented in the histogram peaks. Some cells have neither antigen. Some have one antigen or the other, and very few have both. Many of the plots shown in this tutorial use what is called a bi-exponential scale. This scale transitions from logarithmic scaling at the upper end to linear scaling at the lower end. Depending on your software and instrument, you may also use standard logarithmic scale plots. Bi-exponential plots have become more common with the growing number of digital flow cytometers that have electronics that might assign fluorescence values that are below zero. These data may not display properly using standard logarithmic scaling, although calculated statistics will be correct. Now let's look at data analysis. As we saw in Tutorial 1, it is possible to identify various populations within a cell sample based on their position in the forward versus side scatter dot plot. Remember that each dot on the dot plot represents a cell, and each cell has associated with it all of the scatter and fluorescence data collected at the time it passed through the laser. 
we can direct the analysis software to consider only the lymphocytes by drawing a region around this population. This is called gating. The illustration on the right represents part of the cell suspension. The lymphocytes selected for analysis are highlighted in green. We can draw similar gates for the monocyte and neutrophil regions as well. Once we have restricted the analysis to the lymphocyte cell population, we can produce additional histograms and dot plots that help us dissect subpopulations that we have labeled with fluorescent antibodies. Data from the lymphocyte population can be plotted on a histogram to show the fluorescence from a single antigen or on a dot plot to show the relationship between two antigens. Remember that analyses based on a gated population exclude cells outside the gate. Before continuing our discussion on data analysis in multicolor experiments, we should first look at how to correct for spectral overlap between fluorophores. In a perfect world, the fluorescence emission profile for each individual fluorophore would be a very intense, narrow peak, well separated from all other emission peaks. In reality, organic dyes and fluorescent proteins have broad emission peaks, as you can see from the profiles of Alexafluor 488 dye and r phycoerythrin also known as RPE. For proper interpretation of the data collected, we need to be sure that the fluorescent light we are recording for Alexafluor 488 dye is coming from the Alexafluor dye and not from RPE, which happens to emit some light in the same wavelength range. To accurately record the fluorescence signal for a given fluorophore, we need to correct the emission signal, and this correction is often called compensation. The flow cytometer records fluorescence using an emission filter chosen to collect the maximum amount of light coming from the fluorophore of interest and to exclude as much light as possible from other nearby fluorophores. Here we see Alexafluor 488 fluorescence collected with a 530 nanometer bandpass filter and RPE fluorescence collected with a 585 nanometer bandpass filter. While each of these filters efficiently captures the emission peak of the target fluorophore, each one also collects a little bit of the other fluorophore due to spectral overlap in the emission profiles, shown in red. For this pair of fluorophores, the amount of spectral overlap of Alexafluor 488 dye into the RPE channel is greater and requires more compensation than the amount of spectral overlap of RPE into the Alexafluor 488 channel. In order to see the amount of compensation required to correct the fluorescence, we need single color samples, either aliquots of the cell sample stained with each fluorophore separately, as here, or microspheres that capture an individual reagent. We'll start with the Alexafluor 488 stain. What you want to see is a population with bright fluorescence in the Alexafluor 488 channel. However, these same cells also emit fluorescence into the RPE channel, which results in an apparent upward shift of this population. This signal occurs because the tail of the Alexafluor 488 emission has the right wavelength range to be collected in the RPE channel. This incidental collection of Alexafluor 488 fluorescence by the RPE filter would erroneously increase the magnitude of the RPE signal assigned to Alexafluor 488 labeled cells if left uncorrected. Although this signal is real, that is, you're detecting real fluorescent light coming from Alexafluor 488 dye, it cannot correctly be assigned to the presence of an RPE label. For meaningful data analysis, the emission values must be corrected for the spectral overlap or compensated to remove the Alexafluor 488 contribution to the RPE fluorescence. The Alexafluor 488 labeled population is compensated so that the mean fluorescence values in both the positive and negative populations are equal in the RPE channel. Practically, this is performed for each event by subtracting a percentage of the fluorescence in the Alexafluor 488 channel from the fluorescence in the RPE channel. Depending on the instrument and software used, compensation could be set either in the instrument hardware before the sample is run or within the software after data collection. Every fluorophore combination that shows spectral overlap must be compensated. To determine the amount of compensation for each fluorophore, Control samples stained with each single color are analyzed in parallel with the experimental samples stained with multiple fluorophores. Because the three-color experiment coming up next in the tutorial uses a tandem dye, let's review this important class of fluorophores. 
Most fluorophores have usable emissions that are at most 100 to 150 nanometers separated from the excitation wavelength. In order to gather data from three fluorophores using a single excitation source, scientists use fluorophore molecules called tandem conjugates. In this example, the tandem is built by starting with a protein fluorophore, such as RPE, and attaching a longer wavelength fluorescent dye molecule, like Alexafluor 700 dye. Here you see 488 nanometer light exciting RPE. Normally, RPE would emit light around the wavelength of 575 nanometers. However, because Alexafluor 700 molecules have been attached to the RPE in relatively close proximity to the RPE chromophores, the excited RPE causes fluorescence resonance energy transfer, or FRET, to the Alexafluor 700 dye. The Alexafluor 700 dye then emits light around 723 nanometers in the red part of the spectrum. We can get a better idea of why this works by looking at the excitation and emission plots from the two fluorophores involved, RPE and Alexafluor 700 dye. Fret is possible between these two fluorophores because the emission of RPE is in the excitation range for Alexafluor 700 dye, shown here in yellow. Scientists can take advantage of this shift in fluorescence emission to excite the tandem dye with 488 nanometer light and collect much longer wavelength emission at 723 nanometers. The utility of a tandem can be seen when we consider the emission profiles of the fluorophores chosen for our three-color experiment. To illustrate the different data analysis concepts we've covered so far, the next few slides will take you through the basic steps of a typical three-color experiment. First, we will stain a human peripheral blood cell sample with a combination of three fluorescent probes an anti-CD3 antibody labeled with Alexafluor 488 dye, an anti-CD4 antibody labeled with RPE, and an anti-CD8 antibody labeled with an RPE Alexafluor 700 dye tandem. Single color tubes of the blood cell sample will also be prepared. Using forward and side scatter, we will gate on lymphocytes. Using data from the three single color tubes, we will set compensation. We will locate the T-cells using a histogram of CD3 staining and set a gate. Finally, we will use a CD4 versus CD8 dot plot to determine what percentage of the T-cell population has the CD4 antigen and what percentage has the CD8 antigen. Let's look at the first step of the analysis in more detail. To exclude populations that are not relevant, we use a forward scatter versus side scatter dot plot to distinguish populations of lymphocytes, monocytes, and granulocytes. This type of plot uses linear scaling and is not based on any fluorescence signal that might be coming from the sample. Most cell types have scatter properties that help us visualize various subpopulations in this way. Note that the blank area to the left is our forward scatter threshold, set to exclude debris from the analysis. The lymphocyte gate is created by drawing a region around the lymphocyte population. In this illustration of the cell suspension, we can see which cells are included in the analysis by this gate and which cells are excluded. Remember that each dot represents a cell, and each cell has associated with it all data for scatter and fluorescence. By designating a region in this way, we can look at the various fluorescence and scatter properties of only the cells within the region using subsequent histograms and dot plots. Before proceeding further with analysis, we need to set compensation. Gating on lymphocytes and using data from the three single color controls, we can draw two color dot plots of each color combination. This allows us to adjust the compensation so that the Alexafluor 488 values of the positive and negative populations in the RPE channel are about equal as shown in this dot plot. As explained earlier, this compensation corrects the RPE signal with respect to Alexafluor 488 fluorescence. All the other emission signals that show spectral overlap must be corrected in the same way. After setting compensation, we want to identify T cells from within the lymphocyte gate. One of the probes we use in our experiment, an Alexafluor 488 anti CD3 antibody, is a specific marker for T cells. To see how many cells within the lymphocyte population have the CD3 cell surface antigen, we first create a log scale histogram of Alexafluor 488 fluorescence. Next, we will define regions to capture both visible populations. Region 1, or R1, 
has been set on the CD3 negative peak. These are primarily B cells and natural killer cells. Region 2, or R2, has been set on the CD3 positive peak. These are the T cells of interest. To look at CD4 and CD8 cell surface antigens within the T cell population, we create a dot plot that is gated on the CD3 positive cells in the R2 region from the CD3 histogram. This log scale dot plot shows two parameters at once and displays the relationship between the populations expressing CD4 and CD8. In the CD4 versus CD8 dot plot, you can see four distinct populations. Each population can be defined for statistical purposes using region tools. CD8 positive, CD4 negative cells represent 27.6% of the T cell population. CD4 positive, CD8 negative cells represent 68%. The CD4, CD8 dual negatives and dual positives each represent about 2% of the T cell population. Starting from a large number of cells of various types, we are able to reduce the focus of our analysis to a much smaller population containing specific characteristics. Multi-parameter analyses, similar to this lymphocyte cell surface antigen experiment, are useful in a variety of research and clinical applications. For example, clinicians can use flow cytometry to monitor the CD4 positive T cell population in blood samples taken from patients with HIV. This allows them to assess the progression of the disease and the effectiveness of various treatments. In this tutorial, we have seen how data collected by the flow cytometer can be used to look at everything from cell size and complexity to more detailed features of cells, such as lymphocyte surface antigens. These analyses are possible because the scatter and fluorescence values gathered as each cell passes through the laser are associated with that particular cell in the data file, making it possible to perform a multitude of queries after the actual flow cytometry run has been completed. When you combine this data analysis capability with the throughput of thousands of cells per second, you begin to get an idea of the power of flow cytometry for modern cell biology research. Thank you.